Why intersectionality? In many leftist circles, especially online, there are those who decry identity politics as divisive liberal ideology that poisons the purity of class politics with feminism and social justice. There is a conversation to be had about neoliberal identity politics and how harmful it is when fighting for liberation. However, some leftists use liberal identity politics to smear examples of intersectional leftist analysis and praxis. In retaliation to what they view as idpol, contaminating class politics, some anti-intersectional leftists have adopted class reductionism, which, like neoliberal identity politics, is also inadequate in my opinion when fighting against structural oppression. Instead, these people tend to argue that issues such as white supremacy, the cis-heteronormative culture, and ableism will all be solved after the revolution. How exactly they plan to go about that? I don't know, even though I understand the fall of capitalism will affect these. But what I do know is that neither neoliberal identity politics nor class reductionism will liberate us as both lack analysis based on material realities of the working class. This is why I reject liberal identity politics, in which not supporting Hillary Clinton makes you a misogynist who hates strong, assertive women in power, and class reductionism, which demands marginalized groups to ignore struggles that intersect with their class oppression. Instead, I advocate for intersectionality, specifically intersectional socialism, as intersectionality is the recognition and unification of various struggles and how they intersect, but with a socialist framework focusing on tangible issues which can be dealt with through action even before revolutionary action takes place. Intersectionality understands the intersections of class, race, gender, sexuality, religion, ethnicity, disability, age, and other identities as well as the various forms of oppression that subjugate them. And then there's a material framework applied. Every marginalized person occupies a social oppression and an economic class. Therefore, it is my position that the revolution that is to come forward must be intersectional, both in theory and practice, rather than simply focusing on traditional notions of class. For if we only focus on class, and not our intersections to truly unite us among all the socially and economically oppressed, then we cannot hope to achieve communism. If we are at all serious about creating a free and just society for all, then we must confront all forms of injustice with equal intensity. Part 1. The Problem with Neoliberal Identity Politics To reiterate what I said near the beginning of this essay, I see some of the left's hatred towards intersectionality is really misguided anger at liberal identity politics, which includes their own mangled form of intersectionality, which is valid, as liberal identity politics is detrimental to any movement looking to create actual progress and material change. During the 2016 presidential election, Hillary Clinton's political strategy had been defined by Daniel Denver as peak neoliberalism, where a distorted version of identity politics is used to defend an oligarchy and a national security state that celebrates diversity in the management of exploitation and warfare. I believe that this is an adequate definition of liberal identity politics, which seeks to exacerbate and commodify our differences for the benefit of the elite. It is neoliberal identity politics that advocate for more female guards and US fighter pilots, as if diversity changes the inherent oppressive and violent nature of these systems that don't exist to serve the people especially the communities liberals claim they want to represent, but instead, capitalists, who must use consistent, constant, unrelenting violence to maintain power. This is obvious when discussing political figures such as Barack Obama. Huey the Queer has done an amazing video discussing how liberal identity politics has shaped his legacy. There is no denying that a lot of the opposition to Obama stemmed from racism, but it's disingenuous to then act as if all criticisms of him are based in racism, especially considering the fact that millions, if not billions of people of color living in the global south and colonized communities at home were harmed by the white supremacist, capitalist, imperialist agenda he helped push during his presidency. As a side note, when acknowledging the fact that Obama did contribute to this, I've often seen liberals either outright denying it happened, engaging in apologetics, or perhaps the most disturbing, taking the fact that he droned thousands of children with a shrug and continue to worship him, treating him like a celebrity and not a warmonger 
who murdered thousands of Muslim women and children with drone strikes, which has been rightly called by Noam Chomsky the most extreme terrorist campaign of modern times. There's also the issue of liberal intersectionality, which recognizes that there are intersections of oppression from both social and economic material factors, but there is no framework for them to solve it. It changes from more women CEOs to more black trans disabled women CEOs. Don't disregard black trans disabled women, disregard the CEOs. Often when faced with criticism of figures such as Obama, Hillary Clinton, or Kamala Harris, their identities are then weaponized to ward off critics. Suddenly, all of their critics are white Bernie bros. Even if they were all white males, that doesn't invalidate their criticisms of these figures. And they completely erase leftist women, brown and black people, Jewish people, Muslim people, LGBT people, and all of these are often their harshest critics. And all the while deflecting valid criticism in the name of fighting against sexism and racism. All this time supporting and perpetuating classism and Western imperialism, which exacerbates racism, sexism, and other forms of bigotry that they claim to want to fight. Of course, this is under the assumption that they want to dismantle the white supremacy or the cis heteronormativity in our culture. Perhaps they do, and are just misguided or unaware that those interlocking structures of oppression are deeply intertwined with and sustained by class inequality. However, more often than not, they only want to improve their own positions within these structures. This leads them to co-opting social justice movements away from creating actual material change and to fighting for representation within the very same systems that lead to these conditions, which is exactly what happened with the Black Lives Matter movement. Summarizing the word of Blake Simons, who's written a great article on the commodification of BLM by opportunists, working class black people laid the foundation and used direct action to fight against white supremacy. The movement has largely been co-opted by liberals, centrists, and opportunistic capitalists looking to make a quick buck off of black pain and suffering under the guise of fighting racial inequality. The phenomenon of capitalists co-opting radical movements created by marginalized groups isn't rare or new by any means. Nor is fake, woke, bougie neoliberals weaponizing identity to divide the working class and defend capitalism. I don't expect much from liberal pundits who get paid to say you can either fight white supremacy or capitalism, pick a side, but I expect much more from my fellow leftists who have fallen into the rut that is class reductionism. Part 2. The Problem with Class Reductionism Whenever the topic of race, gender, or disability comes up within certain leftist circles, you have a few people who insist that these issues are simply distractions within the left and dilute the purity of class politics. They posit that we can deal with white supremacy, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and other forms of oppression that can be dealt with after the revolution and communism is established. The main problem with class reductionism, ranging from the lack of understanding that all forms of oppression are interconnected, by a consideration that only the economic classes of worker and capitalist are the ones important right now, the problem is that capitalism is inseparable from white supremacy, the cis heteronormative culture, ableism, ageism, etc, etc. Instead, these systems are all interlocking and reinforce each other. For example, capitalism in its current form today has largely been shaped by slavery, genocide, and imperialism, all justified by white supremacy. Capitalism has also used white supremacy to divide the working class throughout history, from giving power to the working class whites over enslaved blacks, despite both of these groups being mostly oppressed by the white elite, to using the images of lazy immigrants to dissuade poor whites from supporting economic policies that would benefit them and questioning a system that easily disposes of them as well. Not addressing racism while attempting to fight against capitalism is as futile as attempting to fight white supremacy without addressing capitalism. Both go hand in hand. Moving beyond analysis, I also find it difficult on how a class struggle would be completely untainted by questions of race, gender, disability, and other identities. How would true solidarity among workers take place when we aren't willing to tackle forms of bigotry that permeate our activist circles, from using ableist slurs to not caring about accessibility? Obviously we can't solve it all, but we can work to dismantle the systemic problems linked to these beliefs. 
before we can discuss the issues. How can you unite when the barriers are still up between the oppressed, preventing our revolt? When organizing, how can we not talk about these issues? Some people like to argue against intersectional praxis by claiming that it will alienate working class white people. But there's gotta be a distinction. As of now, liberals are trying to claim that their identity politics are intersectional, which I mentioned before. They're not, and intersectionality has the center class. The white working class is already alienated through capitalism's structures, just like every other marginalization. So that problem is already in the way. But this means including marginalized people in our issues around class and the relations to it as other intersecting parts of both an economic class and as a social position in the structure. Part 3. Making the case for intersectional socialism. Unlike class reductionism and neoliberal identity politics, intersectionality does not seek to divide identities and the structures that dominate them. Instead, intersectionality understands all oppressions are related and reinforce one another. Intersectional socialism understands the material conditions affect not only the economic working class, but the social factors that can intersect with them, especially in social and economic conditions. Moving forward, we must recognize the necessity of intersectionality in rebuilding the left. We must realize that capitalism, white supremacy, the cis-heteronormative culture, and ableism are all interconnected. You cannot effectively examine and fight these systems in individual battles completely separate from one another. If we don't address all forms of hierarchy, we are destined to recreate them within our own activism, which doesn't make it revolutionary, but simply a slippery slope that can end up being reactionary. I say this not only to class reductionists, but race reductionists, gender reductionists, and all forms of reductionism pertaining to identity. This is not to say that there shouldn't be a class struggle. It's to say that this is the most effective class struggle integrating all oppressed groups. This is to say economic power is the exacerbator of cultural conditions which creates material conditions that affect class as well as marginalization. An analogy to this is that economic power is the gas pedal, and class is the engine body that holds the other groups as the whole of the engine when combined. It also can explain how some engines can keep going if their body can hold enough from the gas pedal even with broken pieces. No part is necessarily the most important, but solving each part of a broken engine is key. Intersectional socialism is the way forward to solving our material conditions under capitalism. As well, since liberals are flirting with intersectionality, we can start to slide them towards intersectional socialism instead of liberal co-option. This, however, means defining classes. There are the classes that come from Marx's analysis of the capitalists and of the workers, but these are only the economic aspects of capitalism. Due to the history of how these economic superpowers came about, we have to consider what else could have caused material conditions this drastic. The other dynamic is social factors. The social factors are ones that form out of identities, such as race, which is primarily a ruling class of white people, only of course in the global sense. There are obviously conditions in which there are exceptions to the systemic structure, but it's also centered around the concept of whiteness. These systemic factors apply to all identities as well. LGBT identities, the disabled, women, etc. Creating oppressed groups. These factors are also unique to all environments across the world due to local, regional, and national factors. These intersections then create conditions, social and economic in nature. The aforementioned are material conditions that are created all across the board. This is still class warfare. But there is more than economic class to consider alone. Not just the marginalized groups, not just the workers, but all united as a synthesis of the two. However, if you're a capitalist, you're still a capitalist, and especially if you're a global level bourgeois, your social position of oppression doesn't make up for your oppression of others. But whether your oppression is caused by economics, or social conditions, or both, that oppression should not be tolerated. There is no form of oppression that should be more tolerable or less of a priority for anyone who's on the left. All forms of violence should be intolerable to us. And that is why intersectional socialism is important. Final remarks. Thanks for watching this video and please leave your thoughts in the comment box below as I enjoy hearing your perspectives and criticism, especially when it comes to topics like this. 
I also want to hear subjects y'all want me to discuss. If you aren't already, please subscribe and become a patron if you can. Thank you to all my patrons past and present. Uh, I'm listing you all. Uh, starting with 420-69-360-Flip, Aislinn, Adam Lassick, Alex, Alan Rautwa, Twu, Twu, fuck, um, Anarchist Mugwum, Ben, Bisho Marifato, Boop Le Bleep, Brock Barber, Kate of the North, Cameron, Curtis Sufort, Dakota Hadfield, Days of Summer, Dissonant Dragon, Donald Bornstein, Eden Harris, Elgenberg, Emerald Witch, Emilia Carmella, Evan Willie, Gaster, Google Hushabai Valley, or I'll give you a swirly. Jacob Seabreeze, James K, Jan Anders Brimmer, Jason S, Jordan Hoxie, Josephine Zenwa, Kafka Loves You, Katarina Legit Surname, Kevin Thurber, Lena, Lev Bernstein, Louis C, Lexon 3, Marius Kernan, Mel Chekova, Mel, I'm not even going to try anymore. Michael Glide, Mike Yacomb, Nestor Ivanovich, Nick Hayden, Nicole the Anarchoduck, Omen Mortazavi, I tried, Pascal E, Peter Coffin, Pinya Adir, Pretty Bad Artist, Sam Caesar, Serena Gallagher, Solidarity Dog, Some Random Leftist, This Is Fine, Thorn Melcher, Totally Radical Politics, William Calhoun, and Zazizi, or Muke, whatever. Thank you to all my patrons for donating to me past and present, and if you can donate, as I said before, please donate, it helps me out so much. Uh, thank you, and I'll see you next time. Bye.